Hello, hello! My name is Gunch's Boats, but you can call me Gunch, or Gunch's, it doesn't matter really. Today is Session Zero, and I will be off to a very slow start. Like a Session Zero from tabletop role-playing games, I would like to set down a few expectations, as well as the purpose or otherwise goals of this playthrough. I would like to play through Elden Ring while exploring the concepts, ideas, and stories hidden within, both the mechanical and the narrative aspects of the game. Secondly, I'd like to explore the game and hidden lore in the order it is introduced to us. This means that many things may be hidden from us for some time, but we're going to pretend that we have an incredible memory as we visit together and build upon the mysteries we uncover. I'm very new to speaking with intent to record, and I will likely be prone to rambling. That is, if I don't just seize up with abject fear first. I'm simply somebody who loves literature, narratives, and the mystery associated with the Soulsborne games. Most people consider games like this to be a sort of action-adventure with role-playing elements sprinkled throughout. Hopefully I can show how Elden Ring is, is as much a mystery as it, it is those other genres. Now, let's take a look at those classes. Generally, when I create a character, I've done some sort of aesthetic theory crafting for whom I want them to be. If my whole purpose was to optimize a build to be the greatest killing machine I can be, I'd simply pick a class that has a relatively low number in a stat I plan to never use. Like with the Vagabond here, he's got really low stats when it comes to intelligence, faith, and arcane, generally associated with uh, the casting of spells or incantations. If I wanted a martial character, Vagabond is a prime choice. Since the purpose of this playthrough is to show off as much content and lore as I can rip from it, we'll be dabbling in a bit of everything, so stat choice isn't so much important, since we're going to be treating this a little bit more like a role-playing and lore-digging experience. So we'll take a look at all these classes, watch the cinematic, and then have a nice chat. So we have the Vagabond, the Warrior, the Hero, Bandit, Astrologer, Prophet, Samurai, Prisoner, Confessor, and the Wretch. All of them have relatively similar stats as far as the scope of the game goes. And honestly, over the course of our adventure, these starting stats don't mean a whole lot. It more of dictates what your starting equipment will be, and if you were one for optimization, perhaps you'd want a certain stat to be lower than the others so that the points allocated where you really need them will matter more so so let's just simply create a character it doesn't really matter what we name them since this won't be the uh character we use anyway for the playthrough this will just be to show off the intro cinematic well, actually, let's take a look at base templates. I forget there can be a little bit of lore associated with these. The most common face among the Tarnished. After all, they were all warriors once. So here we have a proper noun already. Tarnished. Seems to be a group. Hopefully we learn more about that soon. Truth Seeker. The face of an austere pilgrim. There are many roads to truth. Which is an interesting thought process. Especially given, you know, a truth seeker. What, what do you associate when you hear a term like that? The first thing that comes to my mind is I think of uh, a tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist. Or maybe if I want to be more charitable, a Fox Mulder type character, say from X-Files. Alright, aristocrat. A regal face found among those who claim noble blood in the lands between. Loner. Face found among a proud and seclusive tribe of folk well versed in ancient legends and heresies alike. A face found among the hardy people of the unforgiving north. Some say they're descended from giants. 
seafarer, the face of one who wanders the sea in search of their home in the lands between. Another proper noun, this time a place instead of a people or group. Reedlander, a face from the faraway isolated land of reeds, where blood is a familiar sight. Draconian. All right, very different from the other choices so far, at least as far as we understand people to generally look like. The stony face of the people of the ancient dragons, among whom life is typically short. We could draw all sorts of uh, speculation and postulates from a declarative statement like that, but perhaps we'll need to venture a little bit farther to make any sort of hypotheses. Night folk. The features of those known as night folk. Few in number, they were said to bleed silver long ago. Very unnatural, both looking and descriptively. The face of the Newman, supposed descendants of denizens of another world, long lived but seldom born. That's fascinating. So we've already established a few brief things during our time looking at the base templates. First, there's a group called the Tarnished. Then we know that there's a land between that is a specific place. We've learned that there are uh, legends and heresies that people may be descended from giants, that giants are real. Uh, let's see. Dragons are a fact of the world. More than likely. And yet, these characters the new men are descendants of denizens of another world <clears throat> well let's go ahead and i've already much like a cooking show prepared some characters beforehand it doesn't really matter what i pick but i will just pick one and we'll start off with this vagabond we'll take a watch of the cinematic and then we will talk about it I'll only peep once or twice during it. The fallen leaves. Tell First, we see a woman. Then a man. The great Elden Ring was shattered. In our home, across the fog, the lands between. Curious how he calls it our home. Now, ye tarnished, ye dead, who yet live. The 
call of long lost grace speaks to us all. Or alone, chieftain of the Badlands, the ever brilliant Gold Mask. Fear, the deathbed companion. The loathsome Dung Eater. And Sir Gideon Othmere. The all knowing. again bless a tarnished of no renown cross the fog to the lands between to stand before the Elden Ring and become the Elden Lord. All right, so first things first, it hands us an emote, which doesn't matter, we're gonna cut to our real character. All right, and so now we're going to take a moment to examine our surroundings briefly and then talk about the starting classes that we could have picked from. This is my own custom starting character, who I will reveal a little bit more of early on. We would normally come up to this woman here on the ground, who has sadly died, and she would have given us the Tarnished Wizened Finger, right? It's an item for online play. It lets us leave little messages behind for others to read, and of course we can read the messages left by others. So even while Elden Ring seems to have majorly single-player RPG components, it features an entire multiplayer cadre of co cooperating with other players, fighting against other players, and many will help and hinder you across your adventures. Take a grand step outside, and we see a magnificent glowing tree ethereal, maybe a little ghostly even, and leaves flowing through the air. So let's take a moment and let's look at the equipment we have for the starting classes. So first off, uh, in no particular order, there's the hero. The hero was our barbarian looking fellow. There we go, the champion set. No, where is it? Uh, they have a sort of gator normally. I may have forgotten it. It's not that important. And they come with a battle axe and a leather shield. Alright. Stand in the light a little bit more. So we can take a look at the equipment itself every item comes with a description some very detailed some very plain headband reserved for the badlands bravest proof that the wearer has slaughtered countless foes following the example of their chieftain horalu the brave warriors of the badlands shun excess adornment so that was a name that was dropped during the cinematic that we watched horalu chieftain of the badlands so it seems that even from the get-go, our characters are less so blank slates, but supposed to hail from particular parts of the world, have certain backgrounds that aid them in their early adventure. And by the looks of things, I don't believe the other items have much different to say. Uh, 
a thick heavy blade attached to a handle, a versatile standard weapon capable of powerful attacks thanks to the weighty blade. These weapons are also regarded for their powerful charge attacks. And then the large leather shield. None of this seems to be particularly lore heavy, the weapon and the shield, I mean. But there's a brief description that comes with the hero where we would depict them from the selection screen. It says, a stalwart hero at home with the, a battle axe descended from a Badlands chieftain. Could be any chieftain. Likely not the Horolu that we have seen referenced already. Next is the bandit. The bandit is not very lore heavy in terms of their equipment. But they start off with the great knife. Oh, there it is. And a buckler. And a short bow. A, black, a mask of black cloth that covers the mouth, favored by bandits for hiding their faces. It also provides some protection against poison. Uh, light for ease of movement and supple for masking sound. In trade, they offer little damage negation. Manchettes made by simply wrapping dirty cloth around the arms. Leather boots worn by bandits. Not very descriptive it doesn't give us any places like the uh hero set offered but it seems that the bandit is one of the three weakest in terms of lore of the whole selection of starting characters so that you can apply your own beliefs and imprint them on the character so next we have the astrologer one of my favorites very lore heavy and my very first character I ever made was an astrologer. And it was a whimsical experience to attempt to be a wizard in the lands between. So let's start with the equipment. Hood fashioned from some cloth worn by those who look to the cosmos above. They read fate in the stars and are said to be heirs of gl the glintstone sorcerers but alas the night sky no longer cradles fate what a strange and ominous phrase implying that they once did you know dictate faith to our uh, fate to some degree but no longer do so and there's an altered version of the robe we take a look at it because occasionally altered pieces of equipment can offer new lore insights Looks like these are more or less the same. Scripture shield. A small wooden round shield. It is light and easy to handle, but cannot offer the damage negation of a metal shield. An ancient, an ancient cipher engraving lines of the circumference. Though it isn't much, it boosts holy damage negation. If we look, its holy is a little bit better than its other elemental resistances. <clears throat> And let's take a look at the... Well, I doubt the straight sword has much to offer. That's okay. And let's take a look at the astrologer staff. Staff of the astrologers. A glintstone is embedded in the tip, enabling it to be used as a catalyst for sorceries. Sorceries must be memorized first at a lost site, or a site of lost grace, and a staff must be equipped to cast them. So we already have the basics of casting shown to us and unlike a battle axe or a leather shield this is a an implement that will be new to us in, in the context of the fantastical world of Elden Ring us as an audience not the characters themselves I like how it has the little side handle there almost like it's a, a tonfa or maybe a nightstick would be a better likening all right and let's see the description for the scholar in the selection menu says a scholar who reads fate in the stars heir to the school of glintstone sorcery okay let's take a look at the warrior different from the hero 
clad in blue. One of the more fashionable choices. They come with a set of scimitars and a riveted wooden shield. And they're also fairly lore heavy. A cowl of a nomadic warrior. The blue color of its fabric symbolizes brisk waters, as fluid and flowing as the sword in the hand of its wearer. Just as still water turns foul, or sorry, just as still water turned foul, stagnation leads to decay. Warriors must remain ever drifting. And so that's a concept that's true to life, as well as several stories and mythologies and belief systems around the world. That flowing water is a pure thing, and that stagnation causes a state of decay. At least, especially when it comes to bodies of water. If you've ever been around flowing rivers and stagnant ponds, there's just a night and day difference between the cleanliness of the water. Uh... The description says, A twin-blade-wielding warrior from a nomadic tribe, an origin of exceptional technique. Alright, after that we have the prisoner. Who is a little ghastly when we look upon them for the first time. I don't believe they have any gloves. There we go. And they, strangely enough, come with an S-talk. The Rift Shield, and the basic Glintstone Staff. So the helmet is going to tell us the most. Iron Mask forced on a prisoner convicted of an appalling crime. Thick, heavy, and utterly stifling. A foul creation designed to torment the wearer, either slowly fermenting hatred within their heart, or a spiritual fervor that is near indistinguishable from it. Given that this character starts with a glintstone staff and has a whole sorcery to their name innately, it uh, it makes me think that maybe they were a minor noble, a page perhaps, because the study of wizardry, I don't know, it, it seems like something for posh rich people, as opposed to your lowly thug. Maybe I'll be proven wrong in time to come but somebody who uses a weapon like an s-talk and a glintstone staff even simply those are weapons of a, a reviled a reviled nobleman who has lost their status or perhaps somebody who just had a place in some sort of noble house these are all postulates that we can apply to these characters to our own satisfaction aside from the words that come from the descriptions themselves and the mouths of characters a lot of what i say here today and in the episodes to come will be just speculation my own wandering thoughts so to speak the description for the prisoner says a prisoner bound in an iron mask studied in glintstone sorcery having lived among the elite prior to sentencing so i should have read that first before i went on my tangent um i believe i forgot to show yes so the prisoner comes with the magic glint blade right old sorcery of the carrion royal family creates a sigil overhead from which an enemy seeking glint blade appears after a brief delay this sorcery can be used while in motion charging increases the delay said to be the prototype of the sword phalanx sorceries wielded by the royal enchanted knights there's a lot to go over there and uh, unfortunately we don't have a whole lot of context what i forgot to mention earlier is that the astrologer the more wizardy style character started with the glintstone pebble and the glintstone arc the most basic glintstone sorcery of the academy of rea lucaria the glintstone serves as a conduit launching magical projectiles at foes this sorcery can be cast repeatedly and while in motion. This is a universal first step on the journey to true knowledge of sorcery. Also, a glintstone of Rhea Lucaria fires a horizontal arc of magic that spreads outwards. This sorcery can be cast repeatedly and while in motion. 
granted to sorcerers who depart from the academy to embark on journeys in order to fend off large groups of would-be adversaries. Fools often roam in packs. And I will demonstrate all these sorceries and weapons in time, of course, as we have requirements for them. Some of you in the audience who are already familiar with the game might be wondering, hey, why do you already have all this starting equipment? And it's just simply for display purposes. All these items will go away when I, we truly start our adventure. So after the prisoner, we have the confessor, also a lore heavy character. Let's get that stuff on. And he comes with the broadsword. The Blue Crest Heater Shield and the Finger Seal. Very fashionable guy. Kind of reminds me of maybe a Templar from the Crusades in some capacity. He almost looks like he has a, a sword insignia on his chest there. Oh, it's larger on the back. So it looks like it looks like a sword with two snakes. Perhaps snakes being a symbol of liars, traitors, <clears throat> unscrupulous fellows that a confessor would want to do away with. Their description says a church spy adept at covert operations, equally adept with a sword as they are with incantations. Well, what incantations do they come with? They come with urgent heal, for one, incantation of the two fingers faithful, two fingers capitalized proper noun I'll need to pay attention to that for later the two fingers has high hopes for the tarnished that even if they should be wounded even should they fall they will continue to fight for their duty heals a small amount of hp and be, can be cast while in motion the confessor also comes with the assassin's approach so this is also an incantation of the two finger servants who once served as the assassins of the round table hold completely silences the footsteps of the caster additionally reduces fall damage and the sound produced by falling this incantation be can be cast while in motion or crouching the assassins were charged with eliminating tarnished who had strayed from guidance let's take a look at the equipment Black hood for blending in with the darkness worn by church confessors. The churches outside the lands between, dedicated to the teachings of the two fingers, send confessors out to follow the guidance of grace. The confessors are loyal servants of the two fingers, ready to hunt down and quietly dispose of their enemies. The confessor hood doesn't offer such, it doesn't offer nearly as much lore or details. And it looks like the other items of the set don't offer any more extra glimpses as to who the confessors are. Already a great template for anyone who wants to apply their own details from a lore or from a roleplay perspective. The wretch simply starts out with a club and they are naked. It's the most blank slate of any of the starting classes. A thick, solid lump of wood. Wielding this striking weapon requires no skill, a simple, primitive weapon that requires only brute strength and persistence to hammer your foes into the ground. Let's see, after the wretch's description says, As poor, purposeless, and naked as the day they were born, a nice club is all they have, and it is a nice club. I really like the blunt weapons in this game. I think that the narrator, or whoever is in charge of writing, these descriptions in universe is uh quite biased all right we only have three characters left so we have the vagabond one of my favorites and i've made most of my characters vagabonds they just i like their starting stat spread i like their starting weapons uh they start off with a longsword as well as a halberd and i love halberds so very much and then they have a blink heater shield they do what's called a fat roll right off the bat with all this heavy equipment we remove one thing and we're back to our regular rolls 
Let's see here. So let's take a look at the equipment. Helm of a knight banished from their motherland. Dirty and battered after enduring a lengthy vagabond journey. The visor is broken and can no longer be lowered. Metal armor is heavy, but also sturdy, offering significant damage negation. And unlike the Confessor, if we look at him, he has no signs, no symbols, sigils, runes, glyphs, whatever you want to call them. Anywhere on his person, or perhaps they've been wiped away, his helmet is broken, his armor and clothes are a bit tattered, but in well enough repair. A significant uh, advantage compared to, say, the wretch. And then a blank shield, no crest emblazoned on it. We can apply almost whatever we want to this character in terms of a roleplay experience, but he has a little more going for him than, say, the wretch or maybe the bandit. But then again, we are only limited by our imaginations. Let's see. The description for the Vagabond reads, A knight exiled from their homeland to wander a solid armor-clad origin. True enough. All right. And let's take a look at the Prophet. So the Prophet character comes with a short spear, the rickety shield, and they also start with the finger seal. As for clothes, they have a blindfold, a robe, I don't believe they have gloves to start with, they do not. And for pants, they have profit trousers, which push a shackle around their ankle. Look at that there. So the interesting thing visually about them versus the others is that they're wearing this big old piece of wood around their neck. Kind of looks like a set of stalks, maybe a pillory. And they're blindfolded. They have a bell on their hip. Uh, a, a, a simple spear. A hack job shield. And they come with two incantations. Let's take a look at those. So they come with catch flame. Incantation or originating from a sinister prophecy. Momentarily sparks flame from the caster's hand. This incantation can be cast without delay after performing another action. The flame of ruin is anathema to the Erd tree, but prophets sometimes glimpse it within the faith all the same. Sadly, when this occurs, their sole reward is banishment. This is our first mention proper of any sort of tree. And aside from... Well, we've really only seen bushes, brambles, and that massive glowing tree in the distance. If that is the Erd tree, and burning it down may be viewed as some kind of heresy, and even with the faithful individuals spot a prophecy containing said flame, they are banished from presumably their homes, or perhaps any town they might be proselyting in. Let's take a look at their equipment. Blindfold of exiled prophets who foretold misfortune and were persecuted and driven from their homes as a result. Why hesitate? If the path leading to the future is clear, just close your eyes and walk. Surely a sign of faith in some capacity. Let's see. The shackle around the neck warns... Or, sorry. The shackles around the neck warn passerby not to lend an ear to their sermons. So it's a, a sign outwardly that other people would recognize at a glance, not to pay any heed to individuals like this. Interesting how they seem to wear it and be allowed to walk around, that they're not shackled in one place, like a town square or what have you, to be belittled by the town folk. That they seem to be able to roam, and they're allowed to speak, but there's a warning about the words that they speak. And let's see. Uh, made from rough fabric that scrapes against the skin like a sharpening file. Ugh. And that's the clothes. We don't even want to talk about the iron manacle around his ankle there. Yeesh. Okay. And... Okay. I, uh, the description for the prophet reads, A seer ostracized for inauspicious prophecies, well-versed in healing incantations. Okay, and lastly, and most certainly not least, we have the Samurai. Comes with an Uchi Katana, 
a round shield and a longbow. They also come with a very different set of armor. Considering all of our other characters seem to be from some sort of uh, medieval European Western concept of clothing, apparel, wizardry, knights, what have you. This is definitely from a uh, Japanese interpretation of that feudal era. I could be using those words wrong. I'm not entirely well versed as a historian to what eras mean what, but you get the idea. Old timey swinging swords. <clears throat> so the Uchi Kitana. A katana with a long, single-edged curved blade, a unique weapon wielded by the samurai from the land of reeds. The blade, with its undulating design, boasts extraordinary sharpness, and its slash attacks cause blood loss. We can see in the bottom middle there, causes blood loss buildup is a passive effect of this weapon. Let's take a look at the armors. Helm made from strips of iron, fastened together. Worn by warriors of the Land of Reeds. The Land of Reeds has long been locked in a miserable civil war, during which time it has remained alienated from the cultures of its neighbors. Little wonder that the entire nation has succumbed to blood-soaked madness, or so it is said. See, it says the same. Says less. Says less. But the armor changes a little bit. When we switch to the altered version, which adds this, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, maybe a mantle of fur? Straw, perhaps? I'm not quite certain what that's supposed to be. Well, let's take a look at what it says. The grimy outer mantle is made from withered reeds from the warrior's birthplace. Okay, so the reeds. Perhaps it com its comfort extends to nostalgic thoughts of home. Oh. And looks like the reeds offer slightly more protection than no reeds. Good to know. And the description says for the samurai, a capable fighter from the distant land of reeds. Handy with katana and longbows. Alright. I say we're good to shift back to our custom starting character. I will give a brief description of in a moment. Have everything assembled. There we are. So this character I have named Foreman Seagull, and I have given him the wrong tool for the job. The digger's staff. So the idea was that in the little bit of foreknowledge and lore I have about this world, that he was a foreman in a mine dedicated to finding glint stones, which we were hinted at using four forms of wizardry. And he wears this big, poofy kind of robe of protection from the elements, and all of his extremities are wrapped. Kind of left it vague intentionally. Uh... Somebody who has a slight uh, affinity for possible glintstone sorceries, but hasn't the knowledge or the upbringing or the, the money means necessary to pursue an education in those things. So a seeker of uh, that sort of knowledge, but not one who was born into any sort of wealth. So now we're back at the very beginning where we started. We look around and we're in a church, a uh, brickwork church. We see a statue here reaching out. We don't know who this figure is just yet, but uh, I don't know. It seems like a jab at the player. Normally you spawn in looking this direction. You turn around. She says, turn around, stupid. You're looking the wrong way. It's not really what she says, but you get the point. We are pointing in this direction. We find the multiplayer item for leaving messages on the ground. And this woman dressed almost in a priestly garb. She's got a chepo on top there, flat, uh, sort of veil around the sides. She's dead before we even know which way is up. We see these doors. We see reliefs on the doors. We see a tree. 
a narrow tree. And then we see another relief at the top there above the door. See a bunch of women, it looks like, wearing uh, hoods, veils over their heads. And it looks like the one in the middle, at least, is holding some sort of jug. Perhaps, uh, it looks like there might be another jug there to the left as well. They seem to be ministering to each other in some capacity. Is this uh, a ritual? Is this just uh, a watering hole? Is this, what is this depicting? Given that they took the time to carve it into these spectacular doors for what appears to be a little church building i assume it has some sort of religious significance along with the trees so we have those little jugs we look around and we see these broken down railings they're made of some sort of material that has a gold-ish color to it a, a tan gold and we see all this it's a rather ornate place, a very nice looking building, despite having the roof partially caved in. Here we have a banner, and the banner depicts on it, it looks like a lion. Not particularly unique, there's lots of crests throughout history, especially in the western world depicting lions. Felt like every other royal family had a lion or two or three in it doesn't really depict a whole lot to us yet. In our world, lions are usually depicted as being fierce warriors, brave, courageous, that sort of thing. So maybe in time we'll see if the symbolism is the same or if it differs in some capacity. Come down here. And looks like the, uh, the church gives way to a bridge. We have a huge statue, looks like a figure, wrapped in golden vines and leaves with a spear. He's got a sideways mohawk. That might be another uh, depiction of a tree on his helmet. It certainly seems organic in some variety. We have this bridge, huge chasm, and if we hadn't already realized it from before, we now readily see that we are separated from that landmass by a unrealistically massive divide. But we do see a castle trimmed in similar furnishings to our own little church here. And it looks like if we pay special attention to those clouds above my character's head there. There's a whole flock. Flocks upon flocks of birds of some variety flying around and above this castle. The castle has these pockmarks in it. Looks like there might be something growing over the pockmarks over there. There's whole walls missing. This place is already in rough shape long before we got here. So we can come over here. We don't have a whole lot of context for what we're seeing. Likely intentional. These games put the layers on you over time. There's nothing too spectacular back here. Repeating designs. They just seem to be a pattern. They don't seem to depict anything in particular. It could be a sword, an eye. Not sure. we come over here we get some more statues these statues seem to be depicting robed hooded men with swords up there we see another little lady holding a jug so we're getting some repeating iconography we now have hawks or perchance eagles steeples stonework and a huge statue of as was introduced to us earlier Queen Merica. Now, there's an enemy up ahead that I've already dealt with, and we will cut to that clip, and then I will resume my rant.
hello, hello. Welcome back. I hope that was a fun clip. I'll have you know that was not a first try by any means. In fact, it took many tries to get that footage. The Grafted Scion is an enemy I absolutely loathe, and for anyone passingly familiar with this game will understand that if you lose, it boots you to the next area. You don't get to retry, you don't get to come back for a long, long time, which means practicing against the enemy to get some decent footage is a laborious and time-consuming process, so to get a run like that was very pleasing. If I was uh, playing for any other reason other than to show off the world and to painstakingly look at every detail I can, I probably would have just allowed myself to die and move forward to progress the game. But now, we actually have a moment of calm. We can look at this environment. See, We see more of these uh, sword statues here. And we have these... I assume these are graves, possibly sarcophagi. They look like they could be used to house per, perhaps important people, like a very ceremonial graveyard, very orderly, by the church over there. But in the middle here, you see a pattern. A bunch of intersecting rings, kind of like the cover of the game. And in fact, we attained from our foe, I guess I didn't uh, unequip everything me getting ahead of myself. We found ourselves the Ornamental Straight Sword and the Golden Beast Crest Shield. So let's take a look at these. Shield of dull gold with a beast engraved in it at its crest. Lighter than most great shields and subsequently easier to wield. The beast depicted is Sarosh, Age Counselor who guides the Golden Lineage. We don't know who the Golden Lineage is, but we've seen that line once already. Well, twice, on the banners before. So, we see that he's a counselor. Perhaps he's a symbol for wisdom and guidance to people. That lion, Sarosh, whoever the Golden Lineage is. And then we have the Ornamental Straight Sword. Slender Straight Sword patterned after an antique ornament. Superior swordsmen prefer to wield one in each hand. After falling from grace, the dregs of the golden lineage sought power and purpose in the past. So perhaps the grafted scion was a member of this golden lineage. Perhaps he needed more guidance since we were able to dispatch him well enough. Now I wanted to show off the ash of war on these bad boys. Golden tempering. Cross the two swords to grant their attacks holy essence, while in effect, strong attack performs a dual-wielding combo attack. And so we've seen this symbol on the ground, and when we use the Ash of War, we see a very similar symbol. Not sure which is the bottom of this sigil, but... We see the rings and all of the uh, branches coming out. It seems to be a depiction of a tree, a very fancy tree, perhaps even that fancy tree. But we can see that we have access to the multi-pronged attack pattern that the Grafted Scion had, as well as the standard straight sword paired combo. But we don't need that for now. We can take a look at this. It looks like lions of some variety. I'm not sure what these uh, sprouting top heads are. It looks like a face with a slender neck just going into a hammer, maybe. I'm not sure what it's uh, depicting exactly, but there's definitely two lions here. And some leafy ornamentation around the edges of the relief. We have a couple tombstones. These ones seem scattered and just stacked on top of each other. Hard to say if these are active graves or if they were piled here for use, given the way that this one is, maybe not. Maybe they were in use and they're just piled. Why they don't get as nice a burial as the other fellows, we do not know. As for what's behind it, not much. That seems silly, though. Silly that they would take the time to put the same pattern on the back. I know it's for ease in terms of uh, gameplay and uh, asset creation and game development. Unless this was uh, once a part of a much greater landmass and people could 
look at the back side of the platform for the statue of uh, Queen Merica, the Eternal, and, you know, feel a, a sense of pride and faith for our patron deity. So we come out here, and most players, when they die to the Grafted Scion, will be shuffled along to the next part of the game. They don't get to see back here where we see more graves scattered about. So here we find our first material, the nascent butterfly. Let's take a look at that. An arcane butterfly with translucent wings. Material used for crafting items, exceedingly rare to find. This butterfly appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life. Don't have much to connect it to now, but we'll try to keep that in mind come out here see a couple more butterflies tombstones rocks or cliff faces we're just out on this very high island just it's been split from the mainland from what it looks like looks like there's a church building over there the castle more butterflies so any of you who are familiar with this game will know that if you defeat the grafted scion you come out here and you're tricked and bamboozled now if you kill the grafted scion in the same session that you fall off the cliff you get to keep your money however because i did not do it in the same session i recorded it a couple days ago i will lose my money ordinarily jumping off of this cliff and dying however i have uh prepared an item beforehand that'll let us keep our money as if we had did it in one session now any sort of shenanigans like that from here on out won't be necessary as i'll have shorter distances between challenging endeavors to uh defeat bosses so let's try to grab this item and see what's up ahead we fail miserably coffins and a damp floor Don't worry, Torrent. Fortune is on his side. We found him here. We really saw all. it for a moment, but she had burned looking hands. One of his kind is sure to seek the Elden Ring. even if it does violate the Golden Order. That's another term for us to remember, the Golden Order. And our character awakes despite the tremendous fall. Somehow we are underground and relatively intact. And oh goody, we have more items to look at. So let's take a look. A sacred flask modeled after a golden holy chalice that was once graced by a tear of blessing filled with crimson tears this flask restores hp with use rest a side of grace to replenish the one washed sorry <clears throat> the one washed up on the grave site was sure to die until this flask was this flask offered its gift of rejuvenation to seek the elden ring and this is the same but it's filled with cerulean and refills our focus points that's what that p stands for we showed up down here. 
Looks like there's an item up there that we can't get to just yet. And just a slew of coffins everywhere, stacked, haphazard. To every which way, there's skeletons. Might have been... I'm not sure exactly what we broke there, aside from the skeleton. Looked like there could have been more. A little dark. Cave. We have a tiny golden tree. A prompt for the Cave of Knowledge, which is the game's effective tutorial. And a ghost. Brave Tarnished. Take the plunge. Of learning and remembrance. Recall the arts of war and your warrior's blood. We have some more statues before we jump down the pit. These statues seem rather unique. I don't recall seeing these at any point later on in the game. And all of them are missing the same hands. So, that might be a flipped version of that one. Looks like they flipped the model to give them a little bit of variety. Now, her pose seems a bit different. Her hands are more level, offset, level, offset. Okay, so I was confused. So they're alternating. Okay, not important. Well, not yet anyways. Let's take the plunge down into the pit. So our goal for this session zero is to get through essentially the first three bosses. The middle one is less reputable, but to get through the first three bosses while talking about our sights, setting expectations, and give me a chance to warm up and learn how to talk unceasingly into a microphone. So now we have a sight of grace here. Oh, right. One thing I forgot to mention, when you start this game and you make a character, you get to pick a starting gift. I picked the golden seed. I wish I'd taken a moment to look at all of them. Perhaps I'll read those off at another time. But we have a golden seed found at the base of an illusory tree. Increases a sacred flask's number of uses. When the Elden Ring was shattered, these seeds flew from the Erd Tree, scattering across the various lands as if life itself knew that its end had come. That's a fun concept. Uh, seeds flying out from the Erd Tree, scattering across the various lands. I believe the term is called bolting <laughs> in relation to real plants, that uh, when they feel like they're at risk, they will uh, go through that process and scatter their seeds about in chance of preserving their line. So we can use the flask to add a, cha uh, a charge to our flask of Crimson Tears. A huge part of me wants to call the mechanic Estus because that's what it was in the last few games. And let's memorize some spells. So we're not meant to have magic with the blade. We as a foreman for a glintstone mine will have access to simply Shatter Earth and Starlight. Very simple spells. Uh, you know I will read the description as well. From the other menu, I would say. Here we are. One of the Glintstone sorceries of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria imbues the, the ferrule of the caster's staff with magic, then thrusts it into the ground. Let's see. Thrusts it into the ground to create a magical shockwave allows one follow-up attack. A stone digger sorcery used by the glintstone miners of the crystal tunnel. At the academy, use of this sorcery was a stigma that marked out failed scholars. Perhaps that could be another piece of lore we can imagine for ourselves. We are a failed scholar. One of the glintstone sorceries of the academy of Rain of Lucaria creates a small floating light that illuminates surroundings. This sorcery can be cast while in motion, granted to sorcerers who depart from the academy to embark on the journeys. Uh, embark on journeys, even during the blackest nights, sojourns underground, or imprisonment in jail, the stars are never far from a sorcerer's side. It's kind of interesting that this is given out to sorcerers who go on journeys along with Glintstone Art, which reminds me. Because we do not plan to use those other things. These aren't real. They were simply for explanation yes they 
they must go. Except for the ones we've earned. There we go. Very good, very good. All right. Now we're like a real starting class, custom starting class. Oh, memory of grace. I don't think I should take a look at this. The memory of first grace, which once guided bygone tarnish to the lands between. Lose all runes and return to the last grace visited. It's merely a cycle. It is merely a cycle. Stand before the Elden Ring, become the Elden Lord. Now, I like to put my healing items in these pockets here. That's just where my muscle memory tends to be. Alright, so we're learning to lock on. Pretty simple. He wants us to use our uh, incantation, but we're not actually smart enough yet. Alright, we'll give it a lock. He wants us to dodge. Uh, time. Essentially, dodging gives you invincibility frames, which is jargon for a brief window where we don't take damage. Here we can grab some Roa fruit. Our first. Did we learn anything? Very like red fruits that grow in shrubs. Material used for crafting items. Easily found everywhere in the lands between. It has a wide variety of uses. So we'll discover some of them. Keep rolling what I want to. Ah, right. So we can use our Ash of War, which is our special ability on our weapon. Ours is Kick. Kicks are especially good at dislodging shields. Short range, though, you can leave yourself open. It's teaching us how to change between targets while locking on. Nothing too crazy yet. We already have a decent pool of money for our level. This is all very simple stuff. Nothing really lore heavy here, unfortunately. Um, I will discuss what the enemies are wearing next time. Here, learning about stealth mechanics. But that'll be fun when we get to delve into who these characters are in a broad sense. They're not named characters, but they do represent groups. Could have gotten a critical hit. Not so important. Ah, oh, right. Stance breaking. We hit stuff hard enough. Breaks its stance. Stumbling it for a moment and occasionally allowing its... Stake of Merica. All right. We have a statue of our Queen Merica. If we die, we can revive here as a sort of checkpoint. Though not a full checkpoint, because we can't change around our equipment. We have a soldier of God. I like his brightly colored surcoat that he has there. Watch me flub the very first fight. How embarrassing. I was really hoping to parry this fellow, but it may not be possible. Well, it's possible. I'm just not that smart. And you're probably thinking, well, you were able to parry the grafted scion. Well, that was after a good map practice. And hates me. There we go. I don't have a lot of practice parrying great swords of these fellows. And as we are evidently seeing, it's not worthwhile. Well, not at this stage. bit of pocket money and strength we have a taunt or a gesture yeah we're so cool not especially but I appreciate the thoughts all right let's open this up Move on ahead. Here we see another grace. We're almost to the end of our little session, but I appreciate the journey we've had thus far. Okay, sorry about that harsh cut. Uh, my wife brought a baby lamb home, and it was quite a surprise. So let's take a look around here. 
looks like an altar of some kind, burnt out candles, vase, sarcophagus, and a wall of fog. Resistant to picks. Here we have two imps in the form of a statue, little candle flames in their mouths, and it looks like slots in their foreheads. And white fire, very peculiar, already showing some hallmarks of a fantasy world, very unlike our own. And another item. So here we get the finger severer and the tarnished furled finger. So let's take a look at those when we have them. Okay, item for online play creates a summon sign for cooperative multiplayer. With the objective of defeating the area boss of the world to which you were summoned. A finger of corpse wax furled like a hook. It is a relic of those who came before left to help those who would come after. And then this item allows us to separate the bond between cooperative players. In case we need to send somebody back home to their own world. Fancy elevator up. Looks like there's this intertwining branch pattern on the elevator floor itself. Here we are lifted up. A series of columns. Very decorative, but no outright symbolism just yet. At least nothing I can recognize. More floral, flowery, leafy reliefs around the place. Let's take a look outside. Here we are. Limgrave. The beginnings of the open world. And there we can see the castle. It looks like there's the statue fella. It's a lot less cloudy than when we were over there. Here we see him momentous bridge the tree again a tower some cliffs mountains in the far distance church building there's a handful of people up in a crucifixion position much like we saw Queen Merica in the opening cinematic to the game Small golden effigy. Does that have anything interesting to say? Uh, let's just send our summoning signs to those pools. These pools. Things like this. I assume, or I know, so we can play cooperatively with other people. So, should we so choose? Another second grace. And even the guidance of grace. Pointing outwards to our next objective and where we will end the episode, that church building over there. But first, let us exchange some flasks. We'll allocate them since we can't cast anything just yet. We'll get there. Let's talk to... Ooh, we have the map it tells us about. Not that it tells us a whole lot. Pretty blank. Let's talk to this fellow. Lead stained clothing little ragged soft blue color white ish mask stained what does he got blue maybe green eyes light colored eyes by the looks of it at the very least oh yes tarnished are we come to the lands between for the elden ring hmm? of course you have no shame in it unfortunately for you however you are maidenless, without guidance, without the strength of runes, and without an invitation to the round table hold, you are fated, it seems, to die in obscurity. So he referenced a whole bunch of things there. But he mentioned the strength of runes, that we're fated to die in obscurity, that we are maidenless, what an insult. As well as the round table hold once again. Uh, a little description we only know about because of one of the starting classes in their equipment. Luckily for you, however, there is one shining ray of hope for even the maidenless. Me. 
Vare. Take care to listen. Are you familiar with grace? The golden light that gives life to you tarnished. You may also behold its golden rays pointing in a particular direction at times. That is the guidance of grace. The path that a tarnished must travel. Hmm, indeed. Grace's guidance holds the answers. It will lead you tarnished to the path you are meant to follow, even if it leads you to your grave. Seems a bit, uh, sardonic, doesn't he? A fellow who seems to know her purpose, but is... telling us about it in a very tongue-in-cheek manner. Grace's guidance will reveal the path forward, most certainly. To Castle Stormvale, over on the cliff, the home of the decrepit demigod, Godric the Drafted. Alright, so we finally have some names for set pieces. We know we are in Limgrave, up there is Stormvale, and apparently a demigod by the name of Godric the Grafted resides up there. It's time you set off, I should think. To Castle Stormvale, on the cliff where grace would guide you if you seek the elden ring maidenless as you are it's time you okay. and if repeat you dialogue. seek so that's how we know we have completed it so when i first played this game release day i played with my brother and the first thing we did was we charged up to stormvale castle we have a whole lot more we would like to explore here in the coming episodes before we get there but we will try to challenge this fellow. Alright. See how rusty I really am. Okay, I may be bad at talking. Fighting. I will do what I can. But this fight that I found isn't too bad as long as you take it slow. I mean, slow. Hopefully you can mix in those heavy attacks. When you feel safe to do so. Now, if you're new to the game, I wouldn't recommend fighting this guy first. Probably have a better time if you went a little farther, got a couple goodies, maybe some better armor. One that's been upgraded two or three times. Just give you a little extra damage. Because he's not too mean, but he will punish you for being greedy, given the opportunity. He's designed to do that. Like that shoulder check there. He got me for being greedy. Justly deserved. And this is an enemy that when we break his posture, we don't get a critical hit on it per se. To be fair, the unupgraded war pick is not the most glamorous of weapons. Let me make 
sure our, we grab our money back off the ground. We can do this. Spot us right immediately. Bad start. try the other day, but I was playing as the uh, prisoner, essentially, and I had his spell, which got a little bit of free damage on him, which was quite helpful. But we don't have to use the pick. We did find the uh, ornamental straight sword. Maybe that's the change we need. The extra damage. If we stick to these bushes... He should walk right past us and we'll be free to grab our money. I saw the big numbers and I just wanted it so badly. Just wanted to see if I could get that to connect. in for a while. Very good to know. There we go. Not too bad. stack of cash. We found an herb leaf flower. We have two things to look at on our way up here. So first the herb leaf flower, a dusky yellow flower that has started to fade to brown. Found throughout the lands between. Material used for crafting items. Said to be fed by... Sorry. <clears throat> said to be fed by leaves that fell from the herb tree in days of iniquity. Interesting. All right, and we found the Golden Halberd. Weighty Halberd, forged of gold, wielded by the Order of Tree Sentinels, heavily equipped knights. Wonder if there's a connection between them and the Golden Order. Likely. Deals holy damage, a masterfully crafted weapon that lives up to its heft, but it's difficult for one of mere human strength to wield. 30 points of strength required. We have 11. We have a long ways to go before we're using anything like that. And a room. A golden room. It's also a new item. There it is. Grace that dwells within the inhabitants of the lands between. The lingering trace of gold. Used to gain 400 runes. Runes are nourishment for the development of any tarnished. Provided a finger maiden can be found. Interesting. So perhaps we can uh, use 
use the strength of runes just yet. We can fast travel between sites of grace. As we see here. This church building will do a better job examining it next time. But for now, to close up the episode, let's grab this. An item for upgrading weapons. Go back to a pick. I like the aesthetic of it. Of it with the outfit and the idea of the character. You're a tarnished. I can see it. And I can also see that you're not after my throat. Then why not purchase a little something? I am Carly, purveyor of fine goods. So that's the second instance of somebody we've run into being able to tell we are tarnished right from the get-go. Is there a, a visual sign? Is it the fact that we're sane? What marks one as a tarnished? What is a tarnished? Other such questions will come in the following episodes, but let's talk to this fellow. I am of a nomadic people, selling wares as I travel. The land has been tainted by madness since the shattering of the Elden Ring. It's only tarnished like yourself, who keep things from drying up entirely. Let's say you're a very welcome customer. So perhaps things are stagnant here in the lands between. <laughs> okay, what is his you recommendation know, to us? If you can spare the rooms, you should buy yourself a crafting kit. A crafting kit allows you to make basic items on your own. Essential, really, if you intend to survive out here for any duration. The kit costs a bundle, and I admit I do take my cut. But the important thing is that you survive. Every customer counts, after all. He's terribly honest, brutally honest, even as, especially as a salesperson, talking about how he's marked up the item that he wishes to sell. Well, we've already gotten some money, a good amount for our meager level, and we can get one, the most important item for this playthrough, the telescope. It'll let us to view normally far away things, but or close up things really close up. So we'll grab one of those. Uh, we can grab the crafting kit. We can grab these cookbooks here. Let's see, a record of crafting techniques left by roaming nomad warriors contains knowledge for surviving in the face of utter scarcity. A record of crafting techniques left by a man who, unable to become a finger maiden, instead became a missionary and went forth to spread holy teachings. So it seems that a finger maiden seems to be a, a rank of some kind. Let's see, short dagger for throwing, has no handguard, the blade is polished and its weight is expertly balanced, throw at enemies to deal damage. This auxiliary weapon, used primarily to constrain an enemy's movements, can still be deadly in the right hands. <clears throat> Astrology tool used by members of the Carrion royal family, a stolen part of a larger instrument. So somebody just ripped this little telescope portion off of some form of compass, I imagine. Allows the viewer to better see faraway things. During the age of the Erd Tree, Carrion astrology withered on the vine. The fate once writ in the night skies has been fettered by the Golden Order. Ominous. I wonder what that could mean. We don't know who the Carrions are. We have a pretty good idea of who the Erd Tree, what the Erd Tree is over in the distance. That massive glowing obelisk monolith that it is, and now we've seen another mention of the Golden Order. Pearl Culling Finger Remedy allows us to access the multiplayer of the game. This empty pot somehow mends itself when broken, a central vessel for crafting cracked pot items. The materials and magic sealed within deploy their effects when the pot is thrown. We'll grab a handful of those, one of each of the crafting kits, and normally we would grab a torch, but soon we'll be able to access our spell of light in the meantime tempted to grab some real armor i think we'll hold on to it for now but we will grab these tips and a notable thing about these tips is that you don't get the information until you buy them and you need a picture for them that has a little feather there right a little whitish gray feather with a blue tip natural or died i couldn't tell you but I'm it's an interesting you detail. To heart. You've made an excellent choice. Oh. Oh. So many tutorials. Okay. 
So now, we can use our telescope and see that his feathers just like that, his cap. They're not all like that, but uh, it seems to be a trademark of the merchants, and we'll see that with merchants to come. Okay. We've talked to these fellows. We've made it all the way over here to the Church of Ella. I appreciate you going on this journey with me. I am excited to see you next time. Hopefully I'll get better at talking and rambling. And for now, a goodbye. Hey!